pleasure uh, to be here as a visiting professor at uh, Linnaeus and I've already got my <laughs> pin to show my beginning membership here and especially at the Concurrences Institute which I think really does represent a major innovation in historical and contemporary global contexts. I'm especially grateful to, to Gunlog for the invitation um, to Osh for making so much of the logistics work, to Margareta for sharing her office, and to everyone here uh, at Linnaeus for the promise of intellectual companionship uh, over the next few months and then I hope beyond. Um, so my title is a fairly long question. How can we build transnational research and learning cultures? It's, uh, this question is the focus of my Canada Research Chairs program for the next seven years. How each unit and how each institution answer this question will vary depending on local circumstances. In setting up the Concurrences Institute, you're starting to frame your own approaches to this challenge. There are no blueprints for this process. On the contrary, there is a growing consensus that a variety of locally based approaches are likely to prove most productive. But there's an important catch to this claim. What we mean by local is changing. And it may be better described today as translocal, that is, as a local that engages across scales internationally in shifting in complex entanglements that mark a turn away from the international toward the transnational and toward the global. So I have two epigraphs for this talk that suggest the transformations both institutional and imaginative, that this turn to the global demands. Boaventura de Sousa Santos and his team claim that there is no global cognitive justice without global social justice. Or sorry, I think I've said it the wrong way around, although they're clearly related. There is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. So the question is, how can it be achieved? Walter Mignolo begins to answer these questions by suggesting that we need, instead of a university, a pluriversity. And he defines pluriversity as having the responsibility of educating future generations to live not only in plurinational states, as has been declared, for example, in the constitutions of Bolivia and Ecuador, but also in a pluripistemic and plurispiritual world. So how can we live ethically in a plural epistemic and plural spiritual world? These are the challenges that universities face everywhere and that concurrences seems well designed to address. For Mignolo, Bolivia and Ecuador offer constitutional models of plurinational states, but they're far from being the world's only plurinational states. In fact, most nation states today are plurinational, but formal recognition of that plurinationality varies widely across jurisdictions. So with these challenges in mind, today's talk will outline my understanding of what's at stake in current internationalization agendas globally, my view of the global context in which universities now operate, and my personal sense of urgency about the need to build transnational research and learning cultures that can fulfill the promise of higher education for bettering our lives within our interlocking communities and for advancing our understanding of the world in which we live. Like many of you, I work on culture, community, and the power relations involved in knowledge construction and the stories we tell. Who knows? How do we know? Who is included? Who is excluded? 
how are global changes influencing what people need to know, and how we learn. As an English teacher, I'm especially interested in the role of the English language in facilitating and blocking transnational communication and knowledge construction. For me, internationalization provides opportunities for decolonizing imperial knowledge formations, unlearning privilege as loss, expanding appreciation of diverse ways of knowing, and respecting the value of all the world's languages. Increased student and faculty mobility, revised curricular and delivery structures, and collaborative transnational research projects each has a contribution to make. So today, based on my experience with various transnational uh, research teams, I'll share some thoughts on what works and what doesn't work when setting up and engaging in this kind of interdisciplinary international research and transsectoral networking projects. And I hope you'll find some links with your own experiences. So my working definition of internationalization is taken from Canadian scholar Jay Knight. Internationalization is the process of integrating international, intercultural, or global dimensions into the objective function and provision of higher education. This is a disputed area, obviously. How we respond to internationalization depends on how we view that goal of integration. Who designs and facilitates its implementation? Who assesses its success according to what criteria? And whose interests it serves? The fear is that integration will mean homogenization and a loss of autonomy for local universities and for the professors and students within them. And there are many pressures to this effect. But internationalization, if handled with sensitivity, can also lead to enriched and diversified curricula, student learning opportunities, and research cooperation. The opportunity is there. To seize it, those of us working within universities will need to cooperate with each other, within our universities and across and beyond the higher education sector globally. Faculty members are best situated to drive ethical internationalization initiatives through our expertise and our networks, and through our commitments to learning as a lifelong process rather than to knowledge as a commodity. But a neoliberal rhetoric privileging a knowledge economy dominated by a climate of crisis, insecurity and fear, and by a fetish for measurement threatens to dominate what internationalization means and how it is practiced. So current debates about higher education often pit a romanticized vision of the past against neoliberalizing agendas in ways that don't allow for much nuance in choosing a way forward. We need to ask how we can build on the strengths of the past while moving beyond its weaknesses. Not all the demands currently made on universities stem from neoliberal agendas, but we do need to recast these debates in our own terms, drawing on local strengths. The Globalization and Autonomy team, with whom I've worked over the last 10 years, has now published eight books in our series with the University of British Columbia Press. And I learned from this process and its output that it's important not to confuse the neoliberal agenda with the broader and more contradictory processes of globalization. Neoliberalism as a term is mostly used nowadays by its detractors to describe trends of market deregulation and privatization. Originally a term to describe the economic policies of the last 30 years, its use has been expanded to describe an ideology of market rule, committed to replacing ideas of the public good by a valorization of individual freedom and choice. The neoliberal agenda has played a major role in globalization 
and in promoting views of internationalization that stress turning education into a commodity and universities into a competitive business. Nation states see themselves in competition for global talent. But internationalization can proceed on different terms. Terms that stress transnational cooperation and which recognize the need to extend democratic values of public participation beyond the local and national spheres into a global arena. So our globalization and autonomy team used globalization as a term to describe all the contradictory pressures of the contemporary moment. And each volume elaborated the concept of globalization in more detail in relation to each book's focus on matters such as global ordering, global history, indigenous peoples, culture, and community with the overall aim of clarifying the choices specific circumstances allowed for enabling communal autonomy or self-determination. So by focusing on developing our definition of autonomy, a definition that maintained the concept of a public good, we challenged neoliberalism's efforts to frame the terms of the globalization debates and to narrow definitions of autonomy to mere self-interest. We also challenged neoliberalism's insistence that its dominance was inevitable with the spread of globalizing processes. And we believed that our own interdisciplinary processes of democratically deciding on our research questions and how to pursue them Presenting a Canadian-based contribution to an international debate was an essential element of our work. So against those who see a globalizing neoliberal agenda as inevitable, I see globalization as involving a struggle over knowledge, over what it means and why it matters, as well as a struggle over how world affairs should be organized and whose interests they should serve. Another project I've been involved with, the Building Global Democracy Program, I worked with them over the last four years, extends this process by bringing together academics, activists, and policymakers from around the world to enhance knowledge and practice for greater public participation and control in the governance of global affairs. This program saw attention to knowledge production and sharing across societal structures as essential to advancing democratic control within a globalizing world. Through its composition and through its practices, the Building Global Democracy program sought to redress gender imbalances and geopolitical and linguistic inequalities reclaiming democracy from its tainted history of imperial control by welcoming input from previously marginalized constituencies into collectively redefining democracy and articulating different models of how it could work. We all learned from our structured conversations and especially from our mistakes. As Sarah Ahmed notes, and I'm quoting her here, when you don't quite inhabit the norms, or you aim to transform them, you notice them as you come up against them. And in her book, she uses a brick wall with no openings to demonstrate this process, what happens when you come up against the norms that don't want to be transformed. But I've put a window here because I see education as providing the kind of openings that we need. Because I believe today's universities need to participate in this enlarged conversation, putting northern perspectives in the crossfire between multiple perspectives generated from different regions of the global south, because we are part of this struggle over knowledge and it's important how we describe what's at stake in negotiating its challenges. 
change in itself is neither good nor bad. What matters is the kind of thinking that change enables and the conditions it creates for recognizing that there is no global social justice without global cognitive justice. So some lament that universities are no longer the elite institutions they once were. More of us are coming to university than ever before. It's a good thing, even when it creates new challenges for financing an expanded system. When I first came to university, most people saw the university's chief function as passing on the wisdom of the past. Now the balance has changed. The university's chief function today is defined as research and the creation of new knowledge to address the problems of the present and to anticipate the future. We know we can learn from the past, but we also know that changing circumstances often lead us to see the past in a new light. So history is more important than ever, but the context has shifted toward understanding the present and anticipating the future and preparing students for a rapidly changing world in which nation states are also changing their orientations. Universities remain important local institutions with local and national functions, but increasingly they operate within an international arena in which they no longer hold a monopoly on knowledge construction. So 2012 was the 25th anniversary of the European Erasmus program, which I'm sure you all know sponsored student mobility within the European Union. The European Bologna process and Lisbon strategy created a European higher education arena a little over a decade ago with the goal of harmonizing structural requirements across its membership to facilitate worker mobility. This supranational regional process has been very influential globally. These initiatives have attracted considerable concern about the processes through which they were brought into being the rationale justifying them, the nature of the reforms, and their implications for faculty and institutional autonomy. Businesses increasingly see opportunities for profit in higher education expansion. And massive open online courses, MOOCs, are increasingly causing excitement about digital course delivery and accreditation. A recent subfield of academic specialization, which actually studies international higher education as a field in its own right, has arisen to chart and assess these changes and the many government and agency reports advocating routes forward. But my argument is that internationalism, internationalization is not a matter for specialist concern alone. I've recently agreed to serve on a new advisory group on international affairs and solidarity set up by the Canadian Association of University Teachers, <laughs> CAUT. The international program is grouped around advocacy, networking, cooperation, and solidarity in international contexts. The CAUT has developed guidelines and principles for international cooperation that include reciprocity, democracy, equity, sustainability, and transparency. These initiatives are crucial for our capacity to articulate an ethical vision of how internationalization might proceed and what it might contribute to creating a more cooperative, peaceful, and just world. One of the global initiatives being monitored by the CIUT is the assessment of higher education learning outcomes feasibility study. It's being carried out by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The purpose is to design, develop, and evaluate a robust approach to measuring learning outcomes in higher education in ways that are valid across cultures and language and across the diversity of institutional settings and institutions. 
So this goes directly against Minolo's advocacy of pluriversity and against the principles of the Concurrences Institute, as I understand it. Um, I think that a hello is only paying lip service to diversity when it asks whether it is scientifically possible to produce cross-linguistic, cross-cultural, and cross-institutional valid comparisons of higher education learning outcomes. And then its second question, whether it's feasible to implement such a system. The initial feasibility study conducted in economics and engineering was cautiously optimistic that it would indeed be possible to create such a homogenizing system. Um, I think that language and culture matter more than these results suggest. I'm not convinced they were taken seriously enough in the initial design of the study, and I believe the full report has now come out, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I think the challenge for us is to find creative ways of being accountable without resorting to mathematical forms of accounting alone. Writing about educational reforms in Australia, sociologist Ray Wynne Connell explains in her words that under a neoliberal regime, educational institutions must make themselves auditable in the process destroying education as an intellectual discipline, undermining teacher-generated curriculum, and destroying the humanist model of the good teacher. The steps that Connell suggests to counter this process are similar to those of our um, current Shirk-funded project, the Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange. We too are seeking more attention to teaching as embodied labor and to the emotional and highly collaborative work that teaching involves, to creating a lively, diverse, and supportive professional culture among teachers, to elaborating the intellectual structure of education, including nurturing the capacity to research. And to understanding education as a process that creates social reality and that steers a society through historical time. Within such a model, the focus is less on itemizing capacities or skills than on analyzing the relations among them. So our project, the Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange, Developing Transnational Literacies, focuses directly on how to understand situated forms of meaning making and the alternative understandings they generate. It's a partnership development project linking a few university-based research projects, professors, teachers, and teachers in training from different parts of Brazil and Canada, two huge countries, with the aim of helping teachers of English develop strategies for promoting critical, transregional, and transnational literacies in their classrooms and their research production. It's designed for Brazilians and Canadians to learn from each other and with each other, as well as about each other. So again, that principle of reciprocity. Our goals are, one, to strengthen transnational literacy and cross-cultural understanding within and between Brazil and Canada. Two, to work with English teachers and teachers in training, to integrate theory and practice, developing site-specific pedagogies appropriate to global challenges. Three, to advance understanding of how globalization is impacting education in Canada and Brazil. Four, to advance the Brazil-Canada relationship. And five, to contribute to understanding how to make this kind of transnational interdisciplinary partnership work. We're still figuring out how to advance these goals together. We've been generating some terrific workshops for teachers and students and some exciting interactions when we meet in person, but it remains difficult to generate the intensive interdisciplinary dialogues that we need and to facilitate regular exchanges on an ongoing basis, sharing work in progress and co-producing work.
Despite the virtual connections now enabled by new technologies, face-to-face -face interactions in a dedicated time period still work best for multi-sided teams. There are also many cultural differences to negotiate and deeply ingrained assumptions to challenge within both countries. These challenges are what make the work valuable and it's often fun to work through these things together when we meet in person. When you're dealing with issues that matter to people, the interaction does become deeply rewarding. Yet while this project's less ambitious in scope than the other projects I've described, I'm finding it too is more complex than expected. Many barriers still exist for unconventional team projects. These exist at all levels, um, institutional within the university, the profession, and across national borders, and also intellectual. So how are we doing for time? Um, I'm going to make this paper available on the web, so I think I'm just going to skip a brief section um, about another project um, called Building South-North Dialogue on Globalization Research, um, where we were able to spend two years working together, but we had hoped to be able to take it to another stage and it didn't work. Um, I think that um, we can learn from, um, or I'm hoping that you can learn from our experiences in applying for funding and not getting it, applying first of all with a project that was too, too closely tied to a research center on globalization, autonomy, and the human condition, so that we applied for a research grant under that name, it now seems enormously ambitious, thank goodness we weren't funded, when we narrowed it to globalization and autonomy, we found we were much more successful. But um, what we also found was that for this grant, we were interviewed by a multidisciplinary adjudication committee. Some of their advice was very helpful, but some of their advice was not. Um, they advised that we keep adding disciplines. So the team got bigger and bigger until we ended up with 60 co-investigators, a team that really was too large uh, for us to work productively together. This is partly why we've produced eight volumes and we're still working on co-writing the final capstone volume for the series. Other advice they gave us, however, was very useful advice to think a little harder about what it means to be interdisciplinary, what kind of methodologies um, are needed, and how the goals of our project might best be achieved. And we had not given these questions sufficient attention in our initial preparation. We had focused on our subject matter, particularly globalization, but we hadn't thought about our interdisciplinary process and what kinds of experimentation within the various methodological models available to us might work best for our project. In reading about your project, I think it's interesting um, that we ended up adopting a similar uh, approach. We decided that what united us was the research questions and that we would allow great diversity of methodology um, different disciplines each bringing their own approaches to those questions rather than trying to force any um, single model like the HALO model I showed you earlier on what we were doing. Um, something else to consider is this question of intergenerational uh, projects. Uh, that Gunlog mentioned uh, in the introduction. Um, 
the senior members of our management team knew we wanted the challenge of trying something different and we knew that we could afford the risks for the more junior members of the team and for the students especially we had about 20 postdoctoral fellows and in the end about 60 graduate students involved with the project and they were very very concerned that being part of such an innovative exciting project could hurt their job opportunities <laughs> as well as help them um, given that silos still operate at many levels of assessment and it's still necessary to prove yourself in disciplinary terms and through single authored ventures even if co-authorship and partnership work is beginning to gain some credibility in some circles and I'd say that in Canada these adjudication processes are changing very quickly in the last few years um, in humanities and social science disciplines it's clearly not just an advantage to have co-published some work it's actually becoming uh, a bit of a necessity but that wasn't uh, the case even very recently the grant adjudication criteria are changing but in other areas of adjudication such as hiring tenure and promotion review and publication criteria are not changing as quickly for the different volumes in our series, we worked really hard um, to make them truly interdisciplinary. But when it came time to have them evaluated uh, for publication funding, we were asked to identify one discipline. And of course, the adjudicators who were chosen were most of them from a single discipline. Uh, though the community's volume for example was evaluated by one person from humanities and one person from social sciences so the standards become a little more difficult and there's more room for disagreement so our team was committed to building a transgenerational network and we recognized the need to provide extra support and different kinds of training for the junior members of our team to help them negotiate this transitional moment in globalizing forms of knowledge production and assessment as the job market changes and university structures shift, the question of what kinds of training are needed requires more thought. And we're definitely going through uh, a reconsideration of what the PhD involves in North America right now. The changing conditions of knowledge production and dissemination are a factor that no current team project can ignore. And this is partly why I've recently joined another project funded from Finland on ethical internationalism in higher education in times of global crises. This is an explicitly post-colonial and decolonial project working to legitimate and integrate pluriversal modes of understanding into citizenship education and to balance an increasing focus on technical training with cultural and cross-cultural modes of performance. And our team has been selected as a formal network within the World Education Research Association, an association of national educational associations. This unfunded honor involves several obligations over the next few years, including producing a substantive report uh, that integrates the state of the knowledge worldwide and sets forth promising research directions. While most members of the team work in faculties of education from around the world, some of us are in English, gender and native studies and in applied linguistics. And I think this kind of work will be essential for pulling information and unlocking the creative potential of international cooperation for facilitating cross-learning cross-cultural learning opportunities. Despite all the publications around global higher education, there still is a dearth of useful data that could facilitate meaningful transnational comparisons. And even within an individual campus, there's often little coordination of internationalization efforts. So among the many models now emerging for transformational internationalization across the institution, the University of Warwick's Global Priorities Program uh, is, is an interesting one to look at. It's identified by the slogan, Responding Through Research to Global Challenges. Um, 
Warwick faculty have chosen a multidisciplinary, clustered approach to focus research on what they call key areas of international significance. And they've selected a number of overarching themes, each with its own slogan that highlights the contribution to the global. So some examples um, are connecting cultures, building bridges to cultural understanding, digital change, realizing the digital future, energy, powering the world through renewable energy, food security, developing a sustainable food system for all, global governance, establishing better rules for a better world. Um, you get my point here, I think. Um, this is one step beyond the strategic plans that each Canadian university has now adopted. Like them, it's clearly still largely generic, providing an umbrella for most work within most disciplines, while also attempting to set priorities and identify strengths. But the difference is that each now also incorporates an explicitly global dimension. Most universities are currently engaging in similar exercises of more or less ambition. My point here is that within this broad framework of institutionalization, there is significant room for distinctive responses based on each university's evolving identity and the needs of its various communities. So I'm not advocating the Warwick model, but I think it's one step ahead in a certain direction of everybody else in trying to build the global into everything it does. Um, you may also know that Warwick is pioneering a new mode of intensified international collaboration beyond joint degree structures. According to one commentator, Alex Usher, Monash and Warwick have decided to join forces um, in a unique way. So an Australian university and a British university bringing an alliance strategy down to the departmental level Joint research teams are being assembled, research platforms are being shared to make infrastructure money go further, and even joint professors are being appointed. Hard to see quite how that will work, uh, but six so far in chemistry. They're building a global brand, building on Monash's already aggressive international profile. Monash has campuses in Italy, Malaysia, South Africa, and joint venture programs in India and China. And they've appointed a joint vice president uh, for Monash Warwick, this new hybrid institution, to help them get to where they want to go. This is based on the analysis of the current global reality put forward by the two schools' presidents, Ed Byrne and Nigel Thrift. They see higher education institutions being stratified into four groups. At the top, maybe 30 with prestigious research and teaching reputations. And at the bottom, thousands upon thousands of institutions that will do mass teaching. In between will be small, specialist niche institutions, such as liberal arts colleges, and perhaps about 50 of what they call globally networked, research-heavy university systems. So they've come together um, because they're hoping that Monash and Warwick can secure places in that top group of 50 and be considered leaders in the field. So Usher suggests that this view may underestimate the degree to which national governments, for reasons of prestige, will keep national research champions afloat. But this alliance model is worth watching. It's showing that some people think that some major changes are underfoot. And to, uh, to meet their challenges, some major changes will be necessary. So I am not suggesting that Warwick Monash is a model for Linnaeus to follow. And I'm not suggesting this analysis is correct. But I think we do need to know what's out there as we plan our own futures. As you examine your curriculum, your research, and your partnerships in these areas, it will be important to be clear about 
the degree of interdisciplinarity that's appropriate for your personnel and your project, and if you opt for a stronger degree of interdisciplinarity, to consult the research, considerable research, on how to make interdisciplinarity work. I know you've been thinking carefully about the disciplinary and sectoral expertise you will need on your team to reach your goals. You've held group discussions about these questions. Um, I would suggest that you consider running trial interviews before applying for research funding, even if the grants you're going for do not include this component. It's a really good learning experience. How will people from other disciplines and other places see your work? Anticipate their critiques and adjust for their advice. Think especially about what implications your choices will have for methodology as you begin the research, the training, and the writing, and as you prepare to communicate your work through publications. And recognize that different disciplines respond differently to interdisciplinary challenges, and decide how much effort you need to make to include a range of perspectives. A recent book that I've read about these questions that I, I've enjoyed is, is called How Professors Think that suggests that some, um, this is an analysis of uh, many grant adjudication uh, committees in the United States and an analysis of how people from different disciplines make their decisions according to different criteria. Some disciplines, such as my own, have very leaky boundaries, she suggested. Other disciplines, such as economics and history, have much firmer borders and boundaries around what is considered legitimate. Uh, one of the useful practices we developed in the Globalization and Autonomy Project was um, to share individually produced work in progress through a process that involves circulating the draft in advance, assigning two people from disciplines different to the author to present the draft to the group, commenting on how they saw its argument, method, relation to our project, and contribution to our goals. And we did this numerous times as we prepared our volumes for publication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in retrospect, we realized that in designing our project, we paid a lot of attention to globalization research and very little to research on autonomy. We did not fully realize that we all had somewhat different understandings of the term until the third year of our team interaction. A 2010 book, Asia as Method Toward Deimperialization, points out that many conceptual slippages in translation of key political terms from English into Chinese, Japanese, and Taiwanese scholarship, and the major analytical differences they introduce into how contempor contemporary democratizing and modernizing challenges are understood in these contexts. The author, Quan Sing Chen, argues that moving the point of reference away from the United Kingdom and the United States changes the understanding of analytical terms such as civil society, state, and informal economy. But the same could be said of many other terms. We've encountered similar blockages which can lead to transformational openings in all our team projects. But such blockages need to be explored for them to become productive. So how to build such genuine sites of difference into interdisciplinary and transnational initiatives such as yours, while also ensuring your work makes sense to external adjudicators, is a challenge. Janart Schultz's Building Global Democracy Project began to tackle this problem on an ambitious global scale, setting up a series of dialogues that were simultaneously transregional, translinguistic, transdisciplinary and transsectoral. These workshops were expensive to run and again I think we learned most from the obstacles that we encountered and from our failures to fully anticipate some of them. But again key terms emerged as an issue. What we found in these projects was that sometimes each discipline may use a particular term in a distinctive way not quite realizing that other disciplines understand the same term somewhat differently. 
And uh, even engineers uh, have told me coming uh, from Asia to Canada um, that some of um, the terms in their discipline that you think would be the same are in fact different and they need to learn a new vocabulary in order to work in a new area. So as a literary scholar with a background in post-colonial cultural studies, I'm interested in the frameworks the group sets itself, the vocabulary it employs, and the assumptions embedded in these. Naming is not neutral. And I could talk at more length about the insights provided by colleagues in other parts of the world into the ideological implications that they saw in terms that to me initially seem neutral or even positive. So in today's talk, I've stressed that internationalization needs to be coupled with collaborative and transdisciplinary initiatives if it is to transform older models of the university into pluriversity structures that can work toward transforming global cognitive justice or s into global social justice. Not all globalizing processes are leading to homogenization, but they are compelling the reorganization and the refocusing of knowledge. We need to embrace this transformational task as an opportunity to enhance education's liberating potential and its capacity to benefit from what Arjun Napadurai calls the right to research beyond its conventionally narrow confines. With the establishment of the Concurrences Colonial and Postcolonial Studies Institute, you're on your way to developing new modes of building ethical transnational research and learning cultures appropriate for your locality. So I'm really looking forward to your questions now and then to discussing some of these issues that I've raised today, I hope with you throughout the rest of my stay here over the next few months. So thank you now for listening. <laughs>